This is February 14th, 2021, Valentine's Day, and uh, why not do a Tay Show on love, I thought. Um, well, one reason would be that uh, it is such a broad, broad, vague term, this word love. And uh, it just stretches in all directions. Uh, I've got uh, maybe a dozen books in my library here at the Zen Center on uh, love and sex and monogamy and relationships. I mean, a lot has been said about this matter of, of love. Uh, but if you don't do it on Valentine's Day, when will you do it? Actually, I did do... Uh, three successive, three consecutive Tay shows of some maybe 10 years ago uh, about uh, love and so forth. Um, but nothing really since then. Um, and uh, this, because of the breadth of the topic, uh, all I can offer you this morning is just kind of a random thoughts, smattering of um, observations and references. Uh, but of course, I will, I will uh, bring as I, much as I can and bring in the Dharma. Uh, this isn't just going to be about relationships, but about what Dharma may, what love may mean in terms of uh, uh, practice and, and, the, and the teaching. There's very little in Zen uh, explicitly about love. Very little. Uh, the word is used, uh, I think, a lot more in Sufism. Sufism being sort of the mystical uh, school of Islam. Kind of the uh, Sufism uh, is sort of the uh, the... Islamic equivalent of Zen Buddhism. Uh, uh, Rumi, the, the marvelous, the unsurpassed Rumi, uh, the, 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 the Sufi sage, uh, uses the word a lot. Uh, but you don't find it in Zen, in the, certainly not in the old text. The obvious reason for that is that uh, historically Zen has been grounded in monasticism. It's been a practice for celibate monks and nuns. And so that whole, whole uh, expanse of romantic love uh, is, would not have found much of a place uh, over these last uh, 1,500 years of, of Zen uh, teaching and practice. But also, Zen, the practice of Zen, leads us to the foundation of love, which is oneness, not two. And we might suppose that what, what monks, what celibate monks, not the way it's used loosely and uh, contemporary Western society uh, to refer to anyone who's in any kind of training, Zen training, but uh, that real monast uh, celibate monastics, um, what they're doing maybe is you could say is they're they're bypassing, they're 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 going directly to the oneness thing. They're 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 bypassing the partner on their way to realizing intimacy. There's a, uh, a story I'd like to read. Uh, I'll paraphrase some of it because it's a bit long. Uh, It, it, this is from this uh, wonderful collection of, of stories 
edited by Jack Cornfield and Christina Feldman uh, under the title Soul Food, uh, Stories to Nourish the Spirit and the Heart. Um, it was The previous title was uh, uh, Stories of the Spirit, Stories of the Heart, but now it's called Soul Food. And uh, in this one entry of these hundreds of stories, uh, it... Oh, I'll just read it, get it going. Uh, I am a monk myself, and this is, oh, excuse me, this is by a Christian monk, a Father Theophany. I am a monk myself, and the one question I really wanted to ask was, what is a monk? Well, I finally did, but for an answer, I got a most peculiar question. Do you mean in the daytime? or at night? Well, he says when I didn't answer, he continued, a monk, like everyone else, is a creature of contraction and expansion. During the day, he is contracted behind his cloister walls, dressed in a habit like all the others, doing the routine things you expect a monk to do. At night, he expands. The walls cannot contain him. He moves throughout the world and he touches the stars. So I think he's maybe meaning that's when, when maybe the monk does uh, most praying. Uh, and then, then the, the, the monk who raised this question says, ah, poetry, uh, uh, well, during the day in his real body, and then this um, this abbot or this father Theophany says, wait, that's the difference between us and you. You people regularly assume that the contracted state is the real body. It is real in a sense, but here we tend to start from the other end, the expanded state. The daytime state we refer to as the body of fear. And whereas you tend to judge a monk by his decorum during the day, we tend to measure a monk by the number of persons he touches at night and the number of stars. Um, this is not the conventional understanding of, of love. Of doing of 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 exercising love um, without a partner, um, but it is truly the the fundamental way to understand love. Uh, learning intimacy with oneself, if if through prayer, if not meditation. In Zen, this this understanding of not to this is this aspiration we have to see through separation, see through division, uh, is represented by placing the hands palm to palm. This is very much what I feel when I when I in Doksan when I bow to people to start. And to end the doksan, uh, it's you could say it is very it is a certain kind of love, love of their true nature as it manifests in the individual. Uh, just to run through the some of the many kinds of love that are so different. There's, of course, mother love, uh, father love. Uh, when when uh, one, of, one of the first of us from staff went to Japan to uh, Bukokuji for a, a stint of, of training there, uh, the Roshi 
Tangan Roshi uh, wanted to give a little tutorial to the monk. He was here from here, a monk at the time, John Sheldon, and uh, he went up. He wanted to give him a tutorial on using the stick, and um, he led him up to the altar, and he picked up the stick. And he turned to John and he said, Father love. It's not in the traditional definition. Father love is not the, the, the unconditional love of, of the mother. It's a, it's a love with, yes, some conditions, expectations uh, that the the child uh, measure up to herself or himself. But this is the, the best way to, to understand um, the encouragement stick and, and why it's used. It's, it's a, a way to um, help the student get beyond the thoughts that create the illusion of separateness. It's a great, in that sense, a great instrument of love. The kyosaku, the encouragement stick. That is, uh, when it's when it's in in the hands of someone who uses it in that spirit, which is essential. In Japan, I learned while I was there, it's all too often used as punishment, even kind of a form of revenge among the monks, but uh, that has no place in real Zen practice. It's, it's love. It's a mother's love, a father's love, love among siblings, such as it may be. Of course, love of one's child, one's children. can't speak from experience about that. There's love, love of, of a friend, a love between students and teachers, love of one's neighbor, There's platonic love. All right, again, why do we, why seldom uh, read in any of the Zen texts the word love. Well, again, because it, it was it was grounded in monasticism because it looks at Zen as directing us to the foundation, the very basis of all love, unity, our innate oneness, with the feeling of oneness. Here's another reason that uh, Zen is not primarily a devotional practice. In the uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Hindu Hindu text, there is they uh, enumerate three kinds of yoga. Yoga um, literally come, is from the same root word as yoke, uh, to to bind oneself in a positive sense. Uh, just like uh, the word religion comes from the root word religare, which means to bind. That is, we would say, uh, to bind ourselves to our true self, to our original mind. Um, and there are three kinds, very broadly speaking, there are three kinds of yoga or spiritual work or, or spiritual direction or method. Uh, the three kinds are uh, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and jnana yoga. Uh, bhakti means d devotional. It's loving devotion toward any personal deity. And that's not really Zen so much. Karma yoga is virtuous action, virtuous deeds. Um, also, that is not the emphasis, the, the real core of Zen practice, but the third, Jnana Yoga, which is uh, based on wisdom, 
uh, the aspiration to uh, to understand oneself, true self understanding, uh, and realizing wisdom. So, another reason why love uh, is not so love per se is not spelled out in, in Zen. But here's one other reason that uh, love is not play explicitly play a part in Zen, uh, in that Zen emphasizes, of course, the need to see through illusion. And a lot of love in the conventional sense, certainly romantic love, is illusion. Uh, meaning the the run-up to the wedding, let's say, if now talking just about romantic love, the run-up to the wedding, uh, this has assumed enormous significance, importance uh, in American culture. I, I'm still floored at the average, the cost of an average wedding, last I heard, this was maybe a couple years ago, it, it wasn't true yesterday during the, I mean, it wasn't true last year during the pandemic, but uh, the, 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 the cost of an average wedding in the United States is $28,000. What a, a misplaced emphasis when you could say the real work of marriage is comes after the wedding. There is a book by a psychologist or psychoanalyst or something that had a lot of, uh, a lot of, it's a best-selling book, um, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And the title was Love's Executioner. And I didn't ever read it, but I, as I understand, it was uh, a reference to how uh, the work of a, of, a, of a therapist, a psychotherapist, is to help the client. I mean, one, one aspect of that work is to help the client uh, see through the projections and the idealization of the other. Uh, in that respect, it's, it's, uh, it's not so different from Zen practice. Because Zen practice just by and by, on its own, uh, will um, remove the filters that we bring uh, in the early, the early stages of partnership. Well, it'll re remove all filters uh, sooner or later um, because Zen... The, the Zazen is a way to see through concepts, ideas, ideals. Roshi Kaplow once uh, quoted D.H. Lawrence saying, Don't poison the real with the ideal. At the time, when I heard him say that, this is my early year or two, first year or two of practice, I kind of flinched. What's wrong with the ideal? We want, we want to have our ideals after all. It's important, something to hitch our stars to. But uh, I've come to appreciate this statement of D.H. Lawrence. The ideal is, is not real. The real, that is, just this, what is here, now, is so staggering, so marvelous, so wondrous, it, it doesn't need any kind of patina on it of our projections
Here's another. <laughs> here's another story <clears throat> from uh, Soul Food, and this is a a Sufi story. When the the uh, so often the the main character in Sufi stories is this Nasruddin, Mula Nasruddin, who's sort of a um, simpleton. But in Zen, we would see him. That's 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 wisdom. Uh, to be a to be a know nothing. So here here's the story. Uh, Mula Nasruddin was sitting in a tea shop when a friend came excitedly to speak with him. I'm about to get married, Mula. His friend stated, and I'm very excited. Mula, have you ever thought of marriage yourself? Nasruddin replied, I did think of getting married. In my youth, in fact, I very much wanted to do so. I, want, I waited to find for myself the perfect wife. I traveled looking for her first to Damascus. There I met a beautiful woman who was gracious, kind, and deeply spiritual, but she had no worldly knowledge. I traveled further and went to Isfahan, there I met a woman who was both spiritual and worldly, <clears throat> beautiful in many ways, but we did not communicate well. Finally, I went to Cairo, and there, after much searching, I found her. She was spiritually deep, graceful, beautiful in every respect, at home in the world and at home in the realms beyond it. I felt I had found the perfect wife. So that to, then the friend says, "Well, then did you did you did you marry her, Mula?" And Nasruddin said, "Alas, he was shaking his head. She was unfortunately waiting for the perfect husband." This idea of perfection is another aspect of the ideal and it's it's so destructive to think we're going to find a perfect person <laughs> we're all imperfect we're all we're all beset with these afflictions with uh the three poisons, greed, ill will, and delusion. All of us, without exception. Just as it's true that all of us, with no exception, is endowed with this luminous Buddha nature. There's this idea <clears throat> that's so widespread that, that that true love should be above the mundane. But much of real love is is the mundane. It's daily life. This is what you find when you stick stick with a relationship long enough and you work through the the adrenaline, that's one thing that I brought up in a in those Taishos ten years ago where I about uh, love and sex and everything, is that they've they've they have found that it, for the first maybe a year or so of a relationship, a romantic relationship, the the dominant uh, chemical in the brain is adrenaline. But then as it goes on into successive years, then the adrenaline uh, subsides and is replaced by, I think they said endorphins, that is the, the chemical that, that brings contentment. But really, whether you're married or not, if you're living with someone, uh, it's, it's almost all about daily life. And the little things that can 
get on your nerves about the other person. You know, I remember Roshi Kapil, certain, <laughs> these certain things stick in your mind, the teacher says. I remember him in Teisho making the point that uh, it's these little trivial things that can they can really bring bring marriages to the to the brink, uh, and he used as an example um, not putting the cap on the tooth the tube of toothpaste, uh, and then using hyperbole he he said more marriages have have been lost because of the difference between uh, the, the one who leaves the cap off and the one who insists that it be put on. It took years before I realized he might have been, he might have been referring to his own marriage. He was married for a while and then was divorced. I think he's divorced. It, it, certainly he was separated by the time he came to Rochester and founded the Zen Center. But that little snapshot of the toothpaste or fill in the blank, those of you who are living in a married state, whether or not you're you're actually married, just consider. Go from the from the kitchen to the living room to the the bedroom and the bathroom and think of the little things that chafe. Really, really, it's it's um, marriage or any intimate partnership is really the highest uh, purpose of it. From my perspective and from Roshi Kaplow's is is that we it's it's a it's a it's a vehicle for helping one another work on ourselves or just leave out the other. It's a vehicle for working on oneself. Uh, someone said uh, that, that love is really true love. I mean, true love is not just gazing into each other's eyes, but standing, something like standing shoulder to shoulder, looking in the same direction. And our, uh, our Zen Center wedding service that we've done for decades, uh, you see, see it there where the, the, the bulk of the vows, the wedding vows are the precepts. And in the marriage vows themselves, there are the, the precepts, and then there are the marriage vows. Uh, in, the, in the marriage vows, uh, we recite, uh, I, I pledge to, to help, we pledge to help one another uh, work on ourselves. And it is a magnificent institution, marriage, for working on oneself. And it really starts with giving. I'm speaking uh, as someone who's now, this year, will be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary and uh, I see no end in sight, <laughs> other than death. Um, and 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 to keep it simple, I, I'm convinced that all any any successful marriage or partnership, and by successful, I just mean long running. You know. Is, is, is based on generosity, giving, the dana. That's the first of the, 
of the uh, six paramitas or the six perfections is dana, giving, giving. Or related to that, giving up, yielding, where, where you're not, not sacrificing your integrity, letting go. This is, this is Zen practice, at, the very essence of Zen practice is letting go, of course, of thoughts. Any, any, anything clinging to the mind, letting go, giving up. Zazen is the is the has to be the very purest form of dana of giving. In that we're 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 giving our attention, giving our attention to the practice we're working on. Or if we're not sitting, let's say if our practice is breath practice. While we're sitting, we're giving all our attention, returning our attention, giving it to the breath. And then when we're out and about doing this or that, then we're giving giving up our attention fully uh, to whatever we're doing. Relinquishing. Relinquishing our uh, the thoughts that obstruct the free functioning of our true nature. Now, of course, um, there's a place for um, for standing firm in what you need. That is, it's, it's so much about finding a balance between um, Yielding to one's partner when you when we run into any kind of a of a conflict or uh, an issue where someone has to give it, stand, it finding a balance between yielding and standing one's ground when to not do so to not stand one's ground would would be some some injury to one's integrity. So we're finding the the balance between no self just going with what what your partner uh, needs or wants and on the other hand uh, the needs of oneself we do have needs uh, we can't just become jellyfish and have uh, our partner walk all over us when to do so would uh, would be a a loss of who we really are. So where is that? What is that middle way? You know, that's that's the meaning of, of Buddhism, and one definition of it is the middle way. What is that in any situation? Let's go to the let's go to back <laughs> let's go back to the toothpaste. <laughs> um, your your partner doesn't know why you make so much of putting the cap on the on the toothpaste. They just don't their mind doesn't work that way. That's not what they is important or vice versa. Uh, the person who has to have the cap on the toothpaste, why the other person can't just put the cap on the toothpaste. So there, okay, someone's got to give. Or um, it becomes just sort of a grinding uh, resentments. Um, and one of my favorite um, little sayings about this this push and pull is comes down to the following: What is it? What's more important to you, being right? or being close. And, and, and that, again, puts the emphasis on yielding, giving, not having to be right. And that's where, that's where practice can be so helpful. 
again, practice where every time we were doing our practice, whether our, our legs are crossed or we're <clears throat> doing something else uh, with our mind free of thoughts, we are, we are exercising this mind of generosity, of giving up, letting go. So um, what may have been impossible for us to resolve with our partner um, in year one of practice is not in year 10 or five or three. It gets easier because Zen is all about the practice of intimacy. Intimacy. It starts with inner intimacy. It starts with inner connection. When we, in our sitting, we can have all these different features of ourself come into awareness. And if we can just sit there, some of them are contradictory, some of them are painful. If we can just go on sitting through, and by sitting, I don't just mean literally sitting, but uh, holding forth, just uh, rather <coughs> uh, staying with it, staying with whatever comes up, then, uh, then we're more likely to be able to do that with, with a partner. And, and, and yet there are some people, let's face it, some people um, are quite possibly more likely to find connection, to, to live in a sense of connectedness or intimacy outside a partnership. Not a marriage or living in a married state isn't, isn't for everyone. But uh, it's something that can change. When, uh, when I was younger, in my 20s, and uh, my only relationship was Moo, it really was. I had no use for um, romantic relationships. I, it, wasn't a, it wasn't an effort, it wasn't a, uh, a matter of willpower. I just was completely devoted to Moo. Well, I don't mean to say that it was absolute or anything, but, uh, but it was largely so. It was a big, big turnabout from my college years. Um, I just had to give up temporarily, as it turned out, I had to give up uh, romantic relationships in order to really get to the figure out this matter of the, not figure out, to resolve this matter of the self. I remember uh, uh, Roshi Kaplow in, in workshops, he would quote uh, a rabbi who was asked, uh, how do I find the right one for me? Uh, how do I find the right wife or husband for me? And uh, the rabbi uh, reportedly said, it's more important to be the right one than to find the right one. What we bring to any relationship is who we are, and which means how integrated are we? How, how patient with ourself, how forgiving with ourself are we? That's how we'll be with the other, with our husband or wife. How loving are we toward ourself? Accepting of ourself. Well, it's just, it will, that's what it will be with a partner. In those early years, my sister Sonia and I made a pact, half, half seriously, but definitely half. It was at least half that neither of us would ever get married. That's how, 
how single-mindedly we felt about practice. Um, I held out for until the age of 43, and then uh, just next thing I knew, I was married, <laughs> which turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. But uh, back to the work of self-knowledge, self-intimacy, it's, it's really all about attention, attention. Is another, it's related to that, is concentration. I have another story here. Uh, from the same book, Soul Food. Uh, a young man uh, had, had had a bitter disappointment in life. He went to a monastery and said to the abbot, I'm disillusioned with life. A wish to attain enlightenment, to be free from these sufferings, but I have no capacity for sticking long at anything. I don't think I could ever uh, s stick with years of meditation and study and austerity. Um, and he went on a bit. And then the abbot said, uh, if you're really determined, uh, that there's a, is there any, the, the, the fellow asked, is there any shortcut for people like me. And the abbot said, there is if you're really determined. But first tell me, what have you studied? What have you concentrated on most of your life? And the guy said, well, not really anything. Uh, I, I, but I guess I suppose the thing that I was really interested in was chess. I spent most of my time playing chess. The abbot thought for a moment and then said to his attendant, call brother so-and-so and tell him to bring a chess board and the chess pieces. The monk came and set up the board in front of the abbot and then the abbot sent for a sword and showed it to the two. O oh, monk, you, you have vowed obedience to me as your abbot and now I require it of you. He's addressing the, the one who had already been a monk in the monastery. You will play a game of chess with this youth and if you lose I shall cut off your head with this sword, but I promise that you will be reborn in paradise. If you win, I shall cut off the head of this man. Chess is the only thing he has ever tried hard at, and if he loses, he deserves to lose his head also. And they looked at the abbot's face, and they saw that he meant it. He would cut off the head of the loser. And he began to play, and with the opening moves, the, the, the youth who had just come to the monastery felt the sweat trickling down his heels to his heels as he played for his life. The chessboard became the whole world. He was entirely concentrated on it. At first he had somewhat the worst of it, but then the other made an inferior move and he seized his chance to launch a strong attack. attack. As his opponent's position crumbled, that's the monk who had brought the chessboard, he looked at him uh, out of the corner of his eyes. He saw in this monk a face of intelligence and sincerity worn with years of austerity and effort. He thought of his own worthless life and a wave of compassion came over him. So he deliberately made a blunder and then another blunder, ruining his position and leaving himself defenseless. And then at that, the abbot suddenly leaned forward and overturned the board. The two contestants were stupefied. And the abbot said, there's no winner and no loser. There's no head to fall here. Only two things are required. And first he turned to the young man uh, um, who had come to the monastery. Complete concentration and compassion. Today you have learned them both. You were completely concentrated on the game, but then in that concentration you could feel compassion and sacrifice your life for it. So stay here a few months and let's see what we can do with your training. So, point being, it's, it's through concentration 
our, our, in our zazen. It's, it's that bringing our full attention. That is itself love. And it, and it e- evokes, it actualizes our capacity for lovingness. Generosity, Donna. It comes out of intimacy. Intimacy also leads to us seeing our partner's vulnerabilities. As anyone knows who's been married for very long, we learn our our partner's blind spots and weaknesses and insecurities as of course they learn ours and that itself leads to forbearance patience living with accepting one's partner's need to always put the cap on the toothpaste or vice versa I can't end the, let the Tesho end without uh, meting, uh, mentioning metta. Metta is uh, uh, loving kindness. In Buddhism, it's a form of meditation. It's not Zen, but it's a form of meditation. And uh, metta is one of the what are called the four divine abodes, um, four play, wonderful places to reach. So it's metta, loving kindness. Karuna is compassion. The third is mudita, which means sympathetic joy. That is joy in others' happiness or successes. It's very, (laughs) it's not so easy to feel that. And then the fourth is equanimity. But back to metta. Uh, In metta, for each of these four divine abodes, there is a, a far enemy and a near enemy. The far enemy of loving kindness is, of course, hatred or ill will. And that's what romantic love, love that's not grounded in something deeper, but is based more on excitement and intoxication, that's what romantic love can flip into, is ill will, as in divorce. I don't mean just divorce, uh, but... uh, a nasty divorce. And then the the near enemy of metta, loving kindness, is, this is more subtle, the near enemy is more subtle than the far enemy, is attachment, greed. In, in the Dharma, there's this basic teaching that craving, greed, uh, is the engine of rebirth, binding us to the world of samsara, the world of suffering. He gives uh, new meaning to the old phrase, love makes the world go round. And yet we were wired as human beings, we're wired to mate. There might be things that uh, surpass that instinct, but it's there. Love, just, just to wrap this up, it's, it's a mystery. Duh, nothing original there, but, and yet it is. <laughs> it is a mystery. Why? Do we stay with one person or never, never bond with another person in the end, in the end, it's about whether there is a karmic affinity with the person. We, we get married because there is a strong enough karmic affinity to make those, take those vows. 
I remember <laughs> I, uh, one of the weddings, I used to assist Roshi Kaplow for a period of years at his, at his wedding, at the weddings he uh, gave. And, uh, and I remember there were two or three weddings in a row where in the, the opening, when his uh, sort of introductory talk to the guests, many of whom were not in the Sangha, uh, he said the following, he said, uh, you, that, that uh, John and Mary have come together uh, now to take wedding vows because of the karmic affinity between them. And when that karmic affinity is exhausted, they'll part. <laughs> I remember the guests, these wedding guests who never set foot in the Zen center before, Buddhist center before, were just kind of stunned to hear that. You can, uh, you can ask whether that was the most skillful thing at the time, but is it true? It is true. When our karmic affinity is exhausted with someone, it doesn't have to be a marriage. It can be anything, friendship. When our karmic affinity is exhausted itself, then we part. It's that simple. Karma is a dynamic phenomenon. Everything is in flux. Everything is dynamic. Everything's in flux. So when we take wedding vows, we're, 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 we are aspiring to see, see it through, through thick and thin, sickness and health, to stay, uh, have fidelity to, the, to our partner. It doesn't mean that it's written in some, in the stars that we will forever be with that person. Well, our time is more than up. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. Happy Valentine's Day.